بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسبيه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا فما بعده my dear brothers and sisters الحمد لله today I got my first uh, covid shot the Pfizer vaccine we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to free us from this وباء uh, free us from this pandemic and to make it safe once again for us to meet and greet and travel and uh, you know, do all the wonderful things that we used to do before uh, with the additional benefit of having learnt to be grateful for them. I think that is the biggest lesson that this pandemic has taught us or at least taught anyone who is uh, thoughtful enough to, to, to anyone who has the, the capacity and the in, intention to think uh, that the importance of being thoughtful and um, uh, subhanallah it's the human condition that we tend to miss things and we tend to be uh, to suddenly become aware of them only when we lose them and uh, alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, taught us this lesson we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy now uh, or a different form of his mercy to relieve us from this and relieve the whole world from this inshallah in today's uh, khutbah which is the second last of this series inshallah um, I want to talk to you about the uh, challenges that face us and will face us going forward um, from 2021 onwards and um, the final challenge that all this will pose is for education, especially Islamic education, to train graduates who can understand the world and interpret it in the light of the Quran and Sunnah. The key to leadership is to differentiate because differentiation creates brand, brand inspires loyalty, loyalty enables influence. To influence is to lead. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us to show the way a way that enables success in dunya and akhirah, success in this life and in the hereafter. Let me remind myself and you that you can, even if you know the path, you can stand and look at a path all day, but at the end of the day, you will still be in the same place. To go anywhere, it's not enough to know the right path. We need to walk. We need to progress. Islam is the path, but we must walk on it. Not just study it, talk about it, look at it, but not walk on it. That won't work. Not to try to change it or make our own path away from it. Islam is a tried and tested path to success, chosen for all of mankind by our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu, who knows what and who He created and what is best for them. That is our fundamental creed. We believe that Allah knows what is best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded us and told us, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرُّ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it is possible that you like something, but there is harm in it for you. And it is possible that you dislike something, but there is benefit in it for you. And Allah knows and you do not know. So we trust Allah. And if Allah tells us that something is good, we accept it. Even if we don't always understand how it is good. As Muslims, we believe this. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for showing us the way. To connect ourselves to Him, Jalla Jalaluhu, and to His Messenger, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. And this is especially critical given that even as we speak, our youth globally are getting ever more disconnected from our ulama and masajid. They were always disconnected from the madaris, except those who studied there and their families. For the rest, Islamic education is a mystery which most are not even interested enough to solve. Most of us are donors to madaris in this country and other countries. If I ask you to name three books that are taught in the curriculum in the madrasa you donate to, can you do it? Just three books. If I ask you what the curriculum 
is designed to prepare the students for can you tell me i'm not criticizing madaris i'm asking you as donors do you know what you are supporting are you satisfied with the results do you check the results please continue to support but don't do it passively ask questions it is your money and you have a right to know what is happening to it it is our current education system that separated allah subhanahu wa taala from his creation and created the gulf between deen and dunya forgetting or ignoring that deen is the name of the method of negotiating the dunya the two are not only interlinked but one has no meaning without the other there is no deen in the grave and there is no dunya in the akhirah dunya is the canvas for us to write our destiny in the akhirah when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam met ibrahim alaihi salam on the seventh heaven during his ascension in al isra wal miraj ibrahim alaihi salam he told us sallallahu alaihi wasallam that ibrahim alaihi salam said to him tell your followers ya muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the jannah has beautiful fertile land and good water but it's a flat open plain tell them that they must plant the trees and gardens there every subhanallah is a tree every alhamdulillah is a tree every allahu akbar is a tree rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us in the famous hadith in musnad imam ahmad that if we recite surah al ikhlas 10 times allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build us a palace in jannah he said if you recite surah al ikhlas 10 times allah will build you one palace in jannah if you recite it 20 times he will build you two palaces in jannah if you recite it 30 times he will build you three palaces in jannah said an awarum al khattab radhiyallahu anhu said ya rasulullah then we will build many palaces rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's generosity and his treasures are more than that are unlimited you can recite as much as you want in another hadith nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the dunya is the tillage of the akhirah ad dunya huwa mazraw al akhirah wa kama qala alayhi salatu wasallam but tell me is this the message that you received through your childhood and youth from whoever taught you quran or in the khutab that you listened to in juma in your masajid even those who did who even those who did tell you this did they translate effort that builds the akhirah as anything other than ibadah did anyone tell you that if you become if you became a scientist or a physician or a surgeon or created a global business or became a pilot or astronaut that could be an equally valid route to jannah as someone who became a special who becomes a specialist in islamic sciences if not ask why not if the, if this division was true between the dunya and the akhirah between deen and dunya if there were two different things then how do you explain and what lesson do we learn from the lives of sahaba who were promised jannah in this life itself so we know that they were successful sahaba, <coughs> sahaba like abdur rahman bin awf radhiyallahu anhu and uthman bin affan radhiyallahu anhu people who were big businessmen in today's terms they were the equal equivalent or more than the big names that we take today as billionaires the short answer is that what matters is not what you do but whether you do it according to the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Islam does not close our options to participate in the world but gives us the criteria on which to base our decisions the reality is that only those who know both worlds can bridge the gap that is what we need today to interpret Islam in the light of modern reality Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us to show the world the way to live in this life not to reject the world and leave the leadership to those who don't know Islam that's how we lost the plot it's not the fault of the teachers or at least not entirely they can only teach what they were taught there in lies the story of our slavery from the time andalusia fell in the 13th century today we are in the 21st century we divorced our religion from the world and the world forgot about us we created a priestly class in a religion that has no clergy and no church 
and thereby we gave the average Muslim an excuse for not learning his religion, even though to learn was fard, obligatory on them. The basics, I'm not talking about becoming muftis, the basics. Let us ask ourselves, how many of our children know ahakamul janais, the rules for preparing a body for burial? How many of our children know how to give us ghusl and to put the kafan and to read Salatul Janazah and to put us in our graves? And then ask, why not? The best person to do our last rites is our own child because the dua of the bereaved is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts. But instead, strangers prepare the body and we ask an imam to do the janazah for our father or mother. Not because we believe the others are more pious, because, but because we don't know what to do. Let me ask you another question. How many of uh, your children can do, can conduct a Jummah? I'm not talking about making big speeches. I'm talking about the faraid of Jummah. How many of your children can lead Salah? Do they know the Masail of Salah? Do they know enough Quran to be able to read Salah? And then, forgive my impertinence, how many of you know all these things? Akabul Janais, Juma, Salah. How many times have I seen people, grown people, who pray regularly in the masjid? You ask them to call the Adhan, they do it wrong. You ask them to call the Iqamah, they do it wrong. How many of us and our children know how to recite the Quran correctly? I'm not saying you have to be an expert in Tajweed. Okay, so you make some mistakes. Okay, because of your, your nationality and your uh, some other language that you are used to, some of the letters you mispronounce, but do you even know that you're making a mistake? Whose responsibility is it to learn these things? We cannot blame the ulama for this. Do we go to them? Do we ask them? Imamat, which was, which was the prerogative of the ruler, became restricted to two rakat of salah. Tragically, the educational regime that produces such graduates is highly truncated, restricted to the madhab of the madrasa authorities and the equivalent at most of a secondary school qualification. Yet, the graduates are called alim, maulana, sheikh. Having spent their formative years in this regime, they emerge with attitudes which are detrimental to future learning. And since they do not have the basics to enter the world of so-called secular education, they can't earn a university degree. It's a very raw deal for these poor students, as well as for the society which they are meant to serve. Islamically speaking, we ended up with two factions. Those who have little or no idea of how the world runs, and out of the anxiety that produces, they reject the world to varying degrees. Bravado disguises fear. So these people disparage science and treat scientific and other civil education with disdain. Little do they consider that they do not even understand what they are discarding. They create a set of blind followers who believe them irrespective of whatever evidence is produced before them. The reluctance in Muslim countries, for example, to vaccinate against illness is a case in point. In several countries, Muslims refuse to vaccinate their children against polio and condemn them to live with deformed limbs lifelong. Polio has been eradicated except in Muslim lands. Today we are seeing the same resistance to the COVID vaccine. For them, for such people, these blind followers, what their chosen religious leader says has more weight than the Quran or Sunnah or science. Such people have great difficulty relating to the world and its emerging realities and challenges. The other group, on the other hand, are those who want to change Islam and make it more user-friendly. They are those who consider themselves on par with, if not superior, to the classical scholars, including the Sahaba of Rasulullah who learned Islam directly from him. These people seem to believe that Islam and its theology is so simple that it needs no preparation to understand and that anyone without even the basic knowledge of Arabic as a language, which is the language of the Quran and Sunnah, can understand and interpret both freely. 
You will recognize such people by the preamble to almost everything they say, which is in my opinion. Islam is a religion which is based on the book of Allah, as communicated and interpreted by his messenger Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which was done according to the other revelation which he received, which is called Wahi Ghair Matlu, the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That is the only opinion which counts in Islam. I say that with full knowledge of both Ijma and Khiyas, because both are bound by the Quran and Sunnah. They operate within the boundaries of the Book of Allah and the teachings of Rasulullah Wasallam. Anyone's personal opinion has no standing in Islam if it is not supported by the Quran and Sunnah. Both of these positions, the ones who reject science and the ones who want to change Islam, both these positions are wrong. Both positions are an indication of a lack of understanding of what Islam is and is meant to be. Both ignore the fact that Islam is the deen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything until the end of time. So something that he chose cannot become outdated or need changing. We cannot create change from positions of fearfulness and apology. We need confidence which can only come with knowledge, real knowledge, rooted in experience and a personal connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ta'alluq ma Allah. As I quoted in last Juma, the enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. We need change, not incremental, gradual change, but total, fundamental, transformational change. Not in Islam, but in our approach to it in how we teach Islam, what we teach, and those who teach it. We need this urgently. What remains unchanged is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the teachings of his messenger Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu sallam. What must change is how we teach and learn these in ways that open the doors of our minds and hearts and show us how to leverage our heavenly assets to show the world the way into a future that is free from injustice and greed and misery and suffering. That is the best dawah, one that you can see and experience. This is a desperate need without which we will continue to produce ulama who find it increasingly difficult to influence others or to bring about change in a society that needs changing very badly. Even more alarmingly, the gulf between the ulama and our youth and others will continue to widen until bridging it will become impossible and the religion will get totally divorced from the reality of life. History is witness. I don't want, I don't want to strike a negative note. Let me assure you that the future is as bright or can be as bright as we want to make it. We need our scholars. We need them to be able to relate to us and to our children. But how? All change begins with the acceptance of the need to change, not with denial. In my next khutbah, inshallah, I will speak to you about what needs to be done. We can choose to remain as we are, consumers, victims, and pawns in someone else's chess game. Or we can choose to change and once again become contributors to the world. It's our life. We must make the choices. The destiny that opens for us will depend on which door we choose to open. And that is what we will be questioned about when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jalla Jalalu. Rabbana faqfir lana dhunubana wa kaffir lana sayyatina wa tawaffana ma'ala warar. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi l'akhirati hasanatan wa qinada wa nar. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyil kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin. Wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.